Hey folks, thanks for tuning in to another ReSound Music Channel video. Today, I'm going to be doing something a little bit different. Well, actually quite a bit different. We're not going to be talking about music, really, at all. Uh, what we're going to be doing is looking at how to treat your room that you record in for sound insulation or sound isolation. Uh, and how to get the best sound possible recorded uh, on a minimum budget, on a DIY budget and a DIYers budget means you know somebody that doesn't have a lot of this um, how do they get a great sound uh, that the pro studios get well mind you the pro studios have got like super expensive really amazing gear that is like the envy of everybody that records at home but it's not outside of your reach one of the first things you need to do is have a decent mic you know whether you've got a you know a fifty dollar mic or, you know, you've splurged and spent 600 bucks or 800 bucks on a good condenser mic. It doesn't matter. It's how you use it that matters. So, whatever the room is that you're in. Now, we're going to deal with room treatments on maybe the next episode. But the first two things that I want to talk about are microphone isolation and speaker isolation. Uh, how to get your microphone to sound like it's not in the room that you're in. Bit of a conundrum, right? Not necessarily. Uh, you know, the high-end studios will have isolation booths that the microphone will be in that's completely soundproofed. Uh, there are no reflections from any surfaces uh, because of the treatments on the walls. Um, or unless you're, you know, in some amazing opera house in Vienna or something like that where you want those acoustics, that's a different story. But for recording at home, most of the time what we do is we add in those reverberant effects with plugins or effects after the fact to make it sound like we're in those amazing rooms. So to offset the sound of your own room, what you need to do is to insulate your microphone from the sound of your room. How do you do that? Well, there's all kinds of devices you can buy. Microphone isolation um, things that you can buy. Look them up. You'll know what I mean. Um, so in researching these things and trying to find um, good, effective uh, devices, they're expensive. You know, you're looking at minimum $100 for a little thing that wraps around your microphone with some foam inside of it. And you may notice over my shoulder here, this little cool thing that I made that looks like it belongs on a transporter deck on Star Trek. Yep, you recognize the foam, right? They use that on Next Generation and Voyager. <laughs> what this is, is a device that I put my microphone into. It's sort of hemispherical, uh, and it prevents the sound from my voice or from my guitar, whatever, my acoustic guitar, from going out into the room and then back at me. And the microphones that you can buy for recording or whatever, um, they will often have a certain amount of off-axis rejection, which means that it'll reject the sound coming back at it. And that's just microphone design. That's another topic altogether. Um, but what this little thing does is, I'm going to grab my phone here and pretend that my phone is a microphone. Okay? So if I was to sing, you know, if I turn this way, and if I was to sing at my phone like this, you can probably hear that the sound is different, right? Because what's happening is the sound of my voice is going past the microphone, reflecting off those other walls and other surfaces and coming right back at me. And that's what the microphone that's right above my head is picking up right now. So if I stay in roughly the same position and I put the phone here and I were to get into a position like this, you'll probably hear that there's a difference already. Right. So what this is doing is it's catching those higher frequencies, the, the problem ones at this point. It's it's catching them and preventing them from spilling out into the rest of the room. Now, a certain amount of sound is omnidirectional. It will go everywhere else. Uh, but what you don't want it doing is getting into the room and coming back into the room and making it sound like you're in that room. Um, if you're singing in the shower, right? Everybody sounds better in the shower. Why is that? Well, two things. You're in a small room, right? So uh, it's likely somewhat flimsy, you know, surfaces that you're in if it's one of those glass type of ones. But two things that work there. Those, that small enclosure is holding in the bass frequencies, right? It's making you sound chestier maybe than you are. 
um, also is very bright in the bathroom. So it's reflecting all of the high frequencies back at you. They're bouncing all around the room doing all kinds of good stuff, right? Um, sound in a way is kind of like light. It goes everywhere, right? So what you want to do is try to contain it so that you get a directional sound from your voice or your acoustic instrument right into the microphone. So when you sing in the shower, everybody sounds great. It's like when you crank up the bass and the treble on your EQ on your stereo system, the old disco smile, right? Bass goes up, high frequencies go up. You sound amazing, right? But that's not what you want. It's dishonest. It's not the way you really sound. It's ex super exaggerated. Um, so a little device like this, this puppy here, what I did was I built this out of an old lampshade. This is an old steel lampshade. Uh, if I move it closer, an old steel lampshade that I had for some reason in my basement. You might recognize the shape of it. I used a couple of plumbing uh, pipe clamps, uh, the kind of things that hold the, uh, the pipes onto the ceiling in your basement. I used some self-tapping machine screws screwed into there, mounted that bad boy on an old mic stand that doesn't work so well anymore. Um, and now I can put it in front of my microphone uh, or behind my microphone, I guess you could say. Um, and it, it, it cuts down on the sound of the room sound. Uh, and because it's an old boom stand, if I loosen the boom here, you can see I can move it this way. I can move it, you know, probably up seven feet. Um, I haven't had to move it like that yet because I've only used it up here. But I'm sure it would work well in that application. So something simple as that. I took a pile of weld bond glue. Uh, move it closer so you can see again. Weld bond glue and, and glued, put gobs of glue all over the inside pushed this acoustic foam into there, uh, weighted it down with a couple of books and hooked some clothespins around the edge till it was dry. And I have myself a microphone insulation or isolation device for a few bucks, right? Barely cost me anything. Um, the mic stand was old. I don't use it anymore because the uh, set screw on the bottom is broken. So I set one of those machine screws through there and bolted it all still. So it's not gonna go anywhere now. Um, it's a big difference. I went A, B with and without it, and it makes a difference. You can hear it for sure in the recordings. Um, step two, isolating your speakers from the surface that they're sitting on. If your speakers are sitting on a table, whatever kind of table that is, the surface that they're sitting on also becomes a resonant surface for the sound coming through your speakers, and that's a bad thing. <clears throat> Low frequencies will um, make the surface vibrate, and what that hap what happens then is it exaggerates the low frequencies that are actually coming out of your speaker. There'll be the sound of your speakers plus the sound of the table vibrating, right? Um, when you lift your speakers up off the table, uh, the fancy term is called decoupling. Uh, when you decouple your speakers from the surface that they're sitting on, you eliminate that resonance. So what I made, um, was some stuff out of an old scrap 2x8 that I had in the basement. 2x8 was probably 7 feet long or something like that. I don't know. I don't know why I had it, what it was for, um, but I used it. My, my monitors are 8 inches wide, 9.5 inches deep. They're powered monitors, so they got a little bit more depth because of the amplifier hanging off the back of them. So to get the tweeters at my ear height, which is what you want, uh, we'll deal with why in the next episode, um, I needed to raise the speakers up five and a half inches off the surface they were sitting on. So I cut my eight by 10 board that the speaker sits on. I cut two pieces of wood, three and a quarter inches high uh, that became the uprights in there. And on the bottom, the part that's touching the um, work surface is cork. It's a laminate flooring that I installed in the house. Hmm. I don't know, a bunch of years ago, but I had some off cuts and they were nice looking, so I didn't want to get rid of them because I thought I could find a use for them. And voila, my off cuts from many years ago came to use. Cork is great for absorbing sound. Um, it's a cork laminated to a high density fiber board, so it's super dense and then super not so dense. And in between that, where the speaker t sits on the first level of... Um, two by eight surface. I put three layers 
a shelf liner, drawer liner, whatever you want to call it. It's that non-slip foam that you can get. Um, that decouples the speaker from the stand. Where the stand touches the work surface here, I also put three layers of that stuff down. So the cost of that, scrap wood, um, negligible. The roll of foam cost me $1.40 after tax from the dollar store. And voila, the only thing I had to my advantage in that uh, was the fact that I have a table saw. And the table saw made it handy to um, cut and rip those boards down pretty quick. Uh, with the fence on it, I could just do a couple of cuts and everything was done inside of an hour. Literally inside of an hour. The part that took the longest was when I spray painted them and I had to wait for the paint to dry. <clears throat> the One of the real advantages of this is... Um, when I had the 8x10 surface here, the two uprights, and then the cork surface on the bottom, I had a, a space in between. And you might think, oh, well, that's a resonant cavity. No, it's not. It's open at both ends. Um, what I was able to do is I'll turn the camera around and show you. Just please don't get nauseous when I do this. Um, there's my speaker sitting on top of the stand. There's my interface in front of it. And underneath the speaker... I have a little thing that I could use as a cable run. So it also neatened up um, the cables that I have laying about on my desk by just putting them in one little conduit. They go down there. I drilled a big hole through my um, work surface here where the, uh, the main left and right outs go out to the subwoofer. The other lines come back up into the mains. So um, and the power cable and the USB cable to the computer. They all run through there and neaten things up. Funny thing is, is um, when you talk about a mess of cables, anybody that runs, you know, a lot of home audio stuff will understand. Um, you get a lot of cables. You know, if you got a 5.1 system at home or something like that. Um, I thought I had lost one of my pairs of glasses for hmm, maybe six or eight months. Um, I had no idea where I left them. And what happened was these glasses here they're black I set them on top of where I had my computer st stuff set up before they fell down in the back and were effectively camouflaged <laughs> by uh, they were effectively camouflaged by the cables that were in there so I couldn't tell my glasses from the cables so I've decluttered I've decoupled I have sound isolated and I would say that even if I were to have gone out and bought all this stuff you know, maybe two square feet of foam. Um, a two by eight would cost you about 16 bucks. Um, a $5 box of screws. A bunch of squirts of weld bond, maybe a third of a bottle of weld bond. Uh, maybe under 50 bucks. And I've made proper speaker stands, microphone insulation. Uh, but because this was all found materials, I think I probably pulled these two things off for under twenty dollars and that's a big big deal uh, for a guy on a budget like I have and for most people that are just maybe getting into recording um, this is a great way to start to get your mixes to sound like you're not new you know proper sound isolation insulation um, will deal like I said before with room treatment in another episode um, but simple little things like this little I don't want to call them hacks I hate that word um, simple little things you can do to make any recording environment that you have sound like it's a pro level recording environment um, so anyways that's it for this episode um, if you've liked what you've seen if you've enjoyed what you've seen if you've learned something from what we've talked about today uh, click like and subscribe there are those things in there um, there's a little bell thing that you can ding somewhere in there that will alert you to when uh, I post new videos on stuff um, and if you if you really dig what you saw maybe uh, maybe share it on your social media uh, social media is our currency you know for guys like me um, we don't make any money off it until we're really famous on YouTube um, but to have you know people like and subscribe means a whole lot so if you uh, if you dig what I was talking about today do the like and subscribe thing. Maybe give a share if you're in a generous mood. Uh, next time we're going to talk about room treatment. And uh, I don't know. 
what we're going to talk about for the third episode. But yeah, so thank you for watching. Bye-bye.